all to the July 22nd Zoning Board Appeals meeting for the town of New Paltz. Entertain a motion to start and open the meeting. Carolyn? Yes. Caroline. Caroline, sorry. I'll get it right. One of you, please, Caroline. Sorry. <laughs> All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Meeting opened. Okay, we'll take the attendance first. Leonard Lowe's is here. Caroline is here. Stephen Esposito is here. Catherine, are you there? Yes, I'm yes, here. I'm okay, thank you. And Catherine is here. We are short one member. Joe Dusso is no longer with us. He has since resigned. If anyone knows of someone that would like to join the, jo the Zoning Board of Appeals, please submit a letter of intent. <clears throat> okay. Um, Pat, are there any minutes to review? Yes, June 10th, the minutes were sent out. Okay. For review. I didn't, Caroline looked at her and said she was um, fine with them. That was okay. the only feedback. Catherine, do you have any questions on the minutes? Uh, no, the minutes were fine. Stephen, do you have any questions? No, I'm good. Okay, I entertain a motion for approval of the June 10th minutes. I first it. I'll I second. It. Okay. All those signify by aye. 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 Okay. I would uh, entertain a motion. Oh, excuse me. Joseph Moriello is here. Our attorney is here also. Mike Russo is in attendance. I can't see who else is there. Stacy. Stacy, our building inspector is here. See any other names or faces to add to the attendance list? Okay, um, I'll entertain a motion uh, to open the to reopen the public hearing. I entertain a motion. You will second, Steve. Yes. Okay, seconded by Steve. All those signify by aye. 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 Okay, public hearing is open. Before the public hearing begins, I'd like to comment. We have received three additional letters with regard to the uh, this particular project. One is from um, Mr. Hoffman, is three pages long. Another letter is from Ron Weber, which is two pages long. Another one from Roy. Capiello, Capri, Capri, Capiello, which is 64 pages long, which has documentation and writing within it. They will be entered into the records. They're way too long to read. It'll take the entire meeting. Um, Stacy. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure you're there. Any any uh, do you have Pat, do you have anyone scheduled for public comment? Um not I sent the letter uh, an email that came earlier but that was from the um applicant's attorney in regard to when you discussed. That was the only um email that I got other than one um that an applicant was uh, felt that they should be able to to view the be be participating in the video conference rather than just a teleconference. Okay. okay. And I told her that this was just for this public hearing. Future meetings will be held with the Zoom application, and we'll be um, opening it up for uh, video conference and live feed to YouTube during the meetings. Okay. Um, we, did, we did receive notification back from the County Planning Board. 
Pat, did all members receive copies of the com recommendations? Yes, they did. I sent it out. Okay, did you send a copy to Joe Morello? Yes, he did. He received and it. And Stacy. Okay. Yes. Uh, did the applicant receive them? Yes, they did. Okay. Does the applicant have any comments with regard to the recommendations from the County Planning Board? You're on mute, Rob. Okay, Robert Cordioso with the law firm of Snyder and Snyder on behalf of the applicants. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Uh, yes, we did receive the comment letter from the County of Ulster. Uh, we agree with the county with respect to the correct legal standard as set forth in the case law, specifically um, the Rosenberg decision, which is from the highest court uh, of New York State, which uh, deems these types of application public utility uses subject to a different variant standard. Uh, with respect to the other two comments, one comment was regarding a review by the Department of Public Works. Uh, I guess my question is, is that something that the town refers to the Department of Public Works, or is that something uh, that the zoning board expects the applicant to uh, to pursue with the Department of Public Works. This is an existing access drive, an existing curb cut, so we don't believe there is any jurisdiction uh, of the Department of Public Works, but we have no objection uh, to its re, uh, timely review. So that would be an okay. initial question. Um, the second item was the uh, request for a note on the plans regarding maintaining the existing vegetation on the property. Uh, we're not exactly certain of what uh, maintain the existing vegetation means. We do have a tree removal plan on the plans. Uh, we believe that we could certainly agree to some type of condition to maintain the surrounding trees uh, by not, you know, actively cutting them down. But obviously, we couldn't agree to anything, you know, any trees dying or being destroyed as a matter of nature. Uh, so with that, we really don't have a big concern over the Ulster County comments. Okay, that that my belief would not be a zoning board of appeals response. Something that the planning board, <clears throat> when in fact you return to them, that they will um, require something from the highway department. So the sooner that you can draft a letter to the highway department and get a letter, whether they return it to the zoning board of appeals or to the planning board. Um, would be adequate as far as I'm concerned. Okay, next item that I'd like to discuss has to do with the response to the 20 questions that Mike Musso, Mike Musso um, submitted to your firm. Mike, are you there? Yes, Chairman, I'm here. Okay, Did, have, can you close the door please, Valerie? Have, have you had a chance to review the responses from the uh, Homeland Towers attorney's firm with regard to 20 questions? We're in the process of reviewing that. We've gotten the downloads as of last Thursday, Friday. Okay. I've had two staff working on it and simultaneously doing our technical <laughs> memorandum. Um, by this Friday, I will have a determination if uh, we're satisfied um, or if there's um, any additional information or clarification needs. And right now I'm just seeing perhaps a handful. Okay, so, is, it, uh, is, there anything that you, is there anything that you can come up with now that might uh, make it easier for them to move along with this process? Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll certainly you... put it, sure, I'd Go be ahead. happy to do that. We'll certainly put it in writing. Okay. Among the handful of things we've identified to this point, um, there's a, uh, a stealth tree option as uh, with a conventional monopole, and you may have looked through the submittal from July. It has uh, <clears throat> alternate simulations, photo simulations. They've also made some adjustments, uh, having a slightly sleeker and smaller um, antenna array at the proposed tower. Uh, they're looking to reduce the number of panel antennas from 12 to 6, which is very positive. So I saw that. Some of those are in response to our questions. 
Uh, the big points of what we're reviewing are two things. One is uh, the height justification. So right now there's a 150 foot proposed structure on the back end of 60 Janssen. In the May filing, there's now three major filings, January, May, and July. Um, in the May filing, there was some information provided on um, alternate height scenarios. So we're taking a very close look at that. There is also some information that was provided uh, for alternate sites that are outside of 60 Janssen and in the overlay district. That's the whole premise of why they're in front of you for a use permit. Um, so we may have some clarifications on some of those plots that were provided. There's uh, overlays on top of coverage that has been modeled for the Janssen road site. Uh, we may need to break those apart or ask Mr. Crosby to break those apart. We're still looking at that and finalizing that item. Um, a couple tweaks on the drawings are possible, one being the stealth tree cross section. Uh, the applicant was responsive. They gave you a very good representation of a stealth tree in Connecticut. Uh, the branch density and the taper is something that we always look at, and I think that's a very good example. Uh, but there may be a couple minor things on the drawings as well. So that's a heads up, and I'll tie up that completeness review. Um, maybe more for comfort as well. Thank you, Mike. Can you uh, educate me something? And in the line, can you please explain that to me? Yeah. Um, panel antennas in this case i think they're looking at models that are about uh, six foot in length um 12 inches or more wide um <clears throat> they have a number of radios that are nested within that length uh when the modeling is done for example and when designs of these sites within a network are done um they need they need a height to work with and it's usually the center line of those antennas Okay. So sometimes you hear that word uh, from kind of a, an architectural or cross section point of view. Where is the center line height of that array? It also plays in and is usually synonymous with the radio frequencies definition. They need to uh, pinpoint a center line height. And that's what they did here. Um, 150 foot tower, I think the center line is listed at 146, meaning the center line of that, uh, the, the panel antennas. And they also modeled at a lower height, a 121 foot center line height. And that's something we're taking a very hard look at, but that would be for say a 125 foot structure. So the center line is always a little bit lower from the top in this case. The, the college SUNY New Paltz has a center line of 121. In Putts Corner has a center line of 61. Clinton Dead Tower has a center line of one six and the platykill north tower has a height uh, a center line of 153 and i'm just a little perplexed as that since the college from the drawings that we or that we saw was one of the larger drawers of the of the databases i don't understand has any given to the college with regard to perhaps a second tower or changing the center line on their tower, if that's at all possible? Well, um, the information that was provided is for Verizon. That's who's the co-applicant here. Yes. Um, there's, also, there's also testimony that I agree with that cell sites are not static. They could breathe at times. Okay. Um, whatever lease they went into, they certainly had a need for the campus, and we're seeing that, um, you know, that that's exploding and taking away COVID when there is a return to campus, when when people are back, uh, find me a college student that's not on one or two or three devices simultaneously. So um, that center line height is not on a tower. That's actually on a rooftop at one of the buildings. Okay. Um, and that's. I think smart co-location, that's something that Verizon looks to do when they can do it. Um, so it it certainly would vary a little bit and it, it it's based all about, about the service footprint. And that site is, um, you know, it doesn't shoot out to the south uh, infinitum across the, the town boundaries and into towns to the south. The capacity in that case 
is being used up. And part of the review of the need for the site is capacity. It's not just those coverage maps, which I'll present to you, but there's also okay. plots of capacity. There's, there's three performance indicators, key performance indicators, which indicate trends in use for all the sites you mentioned, not just the SUNY New Paltz campus. Um, uh, just as a quick side note to that, Chair, um, those capacity plots that were provided back in the January filing, we had certainly looked at those and a question had come up, well, you know, what's been going on through COVID? You know, people are staying home, there's no classes, everything went online. Um, we, we did request information uh, a longer time horizon beyond, I think it was November 2019, that they provided those trends for the four adjacent sites. They also provided expanded trends um, from the first of the year all the way through June, I believe, of this year. It's an important point to be able to look at that and look at those trends. And it's, it's interesting, my preliminary review, they haven't changed that much. I think that's a function of maybe less people or fewer people on the road, but people staying home and doing more um, from their homes or maybe as an essential worker from those workplaces um, it, it's it's quite interesting but you know uh, my my thought I, I I know everyone's thought and hope is that things will be returning to normal at some point um, so I hope that answered somewhat of your question about use it, it, it did I can remember let's say 20 years ago or 15 years ago cell service in this town was absolutely terrible. And then lo and behold, the college worked some kind of an arrangement and they put a tower up and cell service became much better. The amount of data usage at that time and cell phone service, since cell phones were very expensive, was not very big. But right. now, as you've already stated, people have gaming, people have multiple phones. So the demand for data and usage has far exceeded what they started out with. So I, yeah, I that's fair. Yeah. You're I think, absolutely right. I, I think that's fair to say because I remember people used to talk on walkie talkies where they just back and forth with each other. Now it's bouncing off of off of towers, using up the data much more. So I also found out, much to my surprise, that there is a uh, rooftop tower on the Verizon store in the uh in the in the in the town of New Paltz, there's a rooftop um, antenna center line at Five Platykill Avenue, which is the Smoke for Less, which is used to be an old laundromat back there. Um, and then there's one at the New Paltz Fairgrounds, and those are they have a much lower center line, but in fact they are there. So either someone struck up some kind of a deal with some form of a tower company or they just did it and um yeah it was it I, you was know I, if i may I'm, I'm glad we did ask for not just the the kind of the four existing sites that you mentioned um at the start of this conversation we wanted to ensure or understand what else is out there and um yeah we did provide that so I wasn't sure what the black dots in the first RF submittal black back in January were, so this is provided now. Um, I have to look at that a little bit closer. They're either small cells or rooftops. The one at the Ulster County Fairgrounds may in fact be a, a small cell site because, you know, when, it when says it's, time it's crowded, capacity is going to go up in use, right? Um, that's a, a classic example, uh, a concert. Um, or an event like a fair, which may be seasonal, there's supplemental coverage and service that, you know, everybody needs. You know, if somebody's got to call for a ride home or or call an ambulance for somebody. So um, we do have a little more of an understanding, I think even outside the town now, of what's existing in terms of Verizon. Okay. Any comments from any board members? I have a question for Mike. This is Catherine. Mike, yes, Catherine. I see uh, um, some disparate opinions about the efficacy of um, drive test data and drop call information. Um, I was just 
wondering if you could clarify um, what is the validity of those analyses in your opinion? Yeah, and I'm glad you asked that. And um, I, I think the chair made a comment just a minute ago about his observations of how in the wireless field. So it's not just voice. My opinion now, dropped call data is not the sole or probably not the best indicator because, uh, you know, think about what you're doing on your phone or your tablet or your laptop remotely. Uh, gaming, downloading, um, sending emails with large files back and forth for work purposes, et cetera. So um, I, I haven't looked uh, or, or gotten in to look fully at the, um, the applicant's response to that. But uh, drop call is, you know, I think it's maybe one item, but I really don't think it's as important as, important as it was 10 years ago. And I just don't see it as, um, you know, one of the key indices. What the applicant has provided in my mind um, is a low frequency and a high frequency uh, full set of coverage maps, the proposed site being modeled and the existing information for the existing Verizon sites in the area in combination with the capacity and use plots, which I'll describe in that tech memo that will we'll get submitted um, sometime in the near future. Um, in my mind, that's uh, basically the industry standard, and I think that's uh, uh, what we would nor that that is what we would normally ask for and look for. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I have seen drive test uh, being provided. I'm working on an application in, in another locale now, where uh, the board had uh, requested it. But I think in this case, you know, we really have a, as much as we usually see for a, a new tower site. And it's certainly within what the code provided. Thank you, Rick. That was really helpful, and I look forward to your tech memo. Thanks, Kathy. Next item on the agenda I would like to bring forward and discuss has to do with a letter from Rick Golden. Question. Catherine, I mean, Caroline, I have a question. Oh, you have a question. By all means, please. Okay. Um, for the purposes of this application, since there, there's a federally designated amount of time, will, will uh, the completion of the application be when Mr. Musso has all of his questions provided from the applicant? And then what, what would be our time frame for completing our review? Yeah, Caroline, sure Caroline did you receive the letter uh, from Rick, Rick, Rick Golden uh, to Robert Gurioso? Yes, and I just want a clarification of that. It appears, it appears to me, from what I can understand, and I don't know if I'm if I'm jumping out of line to answer, but I'll throw my two cents in, is okay. that the planning board needs to deem the application complete. That application has not been yet deemed complete, and once that has been deemed complete, then the clock would start. The original proposal that the planning board was asking for was November 23rd, which happens to be my birthday, and they settled on September. Um, where was it? It was a time in September. I know that that seemed like a very short time frame, and I was hoping maybe since uh, Mr. Musso is still waiting on some of his technical inquiries to be completed, maybe that would make for a longer time frame. Can someone comment on that, please? Um, I guess that would be Rick or Joe. Um, you're both unmuted right now. <laughs> 
Well, if, if Joe wants to answer, that's fine. I uh, I was having problems with my uh, audio. I think I just fixed it, so I didn't hear the question to which I might be providing an answer. Hey, Kat, uh, you, you, Caroline, you can give the question again. All of these views, and since apparently Mr. Musso hasn't gotten every single one of his technical inquiries answered, maybe that would lengthen the time that we have to complete this. Because um, the time frame starts from when the applicant has completed their application. The, the position of the village is that the shot clock um, is told, um, and it has been told since the first application uh, was not complete. Uh, which was admitted by the applicant at a public meeting. And I know that the applicant disagrees with this, but this is the position of the village. And then they submitted um, some additional documents to try to make it complete. Um, when they did, we had 10 days to go ahead and look at it and um, come up with a determination within 10 days as to whether or not the, with the new information it was complete. And that was the very lengthy um, completeness review that uh, Mike Musso did, um, asking for some 20 odd um, pieces of information. They have now responded again, and uh, we have, the village has 10 days to respond to that new submission to see whether or not now it's complete. And that's what Mike Musso was referring to earlier, that he expects to get that letter out by this Friday and if there's still uh, things that are not complete, then the clock still hasn't uh, run again. Um, and so if, in fact, everything is complete, let's just assume that everything is complete, Mike Musso finds on Friday, then the shot clock will start. And in my opinion, there would be 150 days to go ahead and um, make a determination by all the boards. It's not just the zoning board. Within that 150 days, um, it would be the planning board has to act, the zoning board has to act, and um, Stacy has to issue all the building permits. So there's a lot of things that have to be done at each of those levels, but they all have to be accomplished within the shot clock of 150 days. Um, so we'll find out from Mike Musso's um, completeness review on Friday, whether or not the clock is starting or whether or not it stays told until um, additional information. You froze at that last bit, but I think you meant to say until yes. additional information was received. Yes, if I'm sorry, because somebody else called in, so it blocked out everything. Um, because I'm working from my uh, my handheld. If once all the information is in that Mike Musso deems the um, application recommends and the village will adopt that it's complete, at that point in time, the clock will start. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Muted. You're unmuted now. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> Rick, my, my thoughts are to, if you could give, so I, I, I read your letter with regard to the EMF levels not being controlled by the FCC, that there are no standards with which they, or guidelines that they have. This is being mentioned primarily not so much for the only the applicants, but for those that have submitted letters with large amounts of documentation with regard to EMF levels being a standard with which a proximity of a tower could be from a habitable structure. Sure. Um, so the issue um, comes up regularly with respect to review of cell tower applications and what are the EMF um, ranges uh, that this particular cell tower will um, emit. The um, 
FCC has determined a range that is, or a, a level that is acceptable. Um, and uh, because of Congress acting and saying what the FCC determines in this regard is uh, something that preempts local determinations, um, that you're guided by that. So the Mike Musso is the one who's going to guide you on what are the EMF for this particular site and whether or not they are within guidelines that the FCC deems to be acceptable. If Mike advises you that that EMF level um, is within the acceptable guidelines by the FCC, that's the end of the issue for this board and the planning board and for states. There's nothing to do about that. And it may well be that um, those levels that were adopted years ago by the FCC are outdated, um, but your board is not the one that can correct that. You're preempted by federal law. So if people want to get that change, they have to get Congress to either change that the FCC preempts or get the FCC to change the levels. Um, and there was actually a, there's been at least one case that I've read uh, in which a cell tower was denied by a municipality for some reasons, but there was a tremendous amount of discussion, both by the board and by the public with respect to EMF and how it may be dangerous despite what the FCC says. The court in that case essentially held um, these other reasons that you denied it for don't really make sense. And we think they're just a pretext for what it appeared to the court was the preoccupation by the board and the public with the EMF levels and therefore um, overturned the denial and directed that um, the cell tower application be granted. So I am advising this board and notifying the public that although that's an issue, it's not an issue that this board will ever take into consideration or the planning board will ever take into consideration or Stacy. Uh, in her issuing her permits, if in fact Mike Musso says that the EMF levels are within those that the FCC deems uh, to be reasonable. Thank you for that answer. Okay. So at this point in time, since the public not requested any comments, I'd like to ask a motion to close the public hearing. Oh, Wait, hold on. Are we not? Hold, hold on one second, please. Is there Wait. anyone else that did not speak that would like to speak that has not already spoken? Um, so everybody is on mute. Do you want me to list? Um, yeah. Yes, Len, I also have an email from someone who had and would like to. Hi. It's Pat. I have Hi, an Pat. email from someone who um, had surgery and they couldn't call in, and but she sent an email and she would like it read tonight. So if we have time for that. You can do that right now if you would, please. Okay, hold on. I'm going to switch over to the email. Okay, dear secretary of the zoning board of New Paltz, my name is Barbara Scott Fisher and I live at 73 Jansen Road in New Paltz, diagonally across from 60 Jansen Road. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 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 Um, I have recently undergone surgery and do not have the strength or stamina to wait to be called during the phone in portion of the hearing tonight and hope you will accept my email in place of it. I do wish to have my position heard. I am vehemently opposed to a 150 foot cell tower to be erected across from my home. This is a nice community I live in, beautiful and picturesque in all, play, in all ways with homes and families. To even think of considering a variance to allow such an eyesore would ruin this whole area with a 150 foot monstrosity looming over the homes. If that isn't bad enough, I will not sit by and allow my home and property, property be devalued by 15 to 20 percent. This is an outrage. I pay my taxes and to think that the town of New Paltz planning and zoning boards would even consider 
the proposal from this neighbor to allow such a thing to happen is unconscionable. A, a 150 foot cell tower has no place in a nice community such as this on Jansen Road and should be placed in a completely rural setting away from home so they won't be deval devalued and away from the scenic beauty I look I love to look at every day from my win window. The beauty of the sunsets I see from my home is every painter's dream come true, and I don't want this taken away. Do not allow any variance for such an intrusive and obstructive structure on Jansen Road. Sincerely, Barbara Scott Fisher. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Kelly, is there anyone else? Yes, so the first person that is on is Larry Hopman. I just uh, wanted to second Mrs. Fisher's objections to the placing of the cell tower. I've already written to the zoning board on several occasions and testified. Yes, we have had Thank you. I have both of your letters. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, the next person is Kemble Matter. Hi. Hi. I can, see this proposed, I can see this proposed tower from all windows on the back of our house and every vantage point in our backyard. I've seen towers like such as this and they are they're, they're just damn ugly. I don't wish to look at this for the rest of my life. I built a house here in a residential area in 1986. This board should respect the wishes of the residents that have written letters and called in. This truly doesn't belong in a residential neighborhood. Thank you. Okay, the next one is Ray Shilke. Hi, um, I have nothing to say. I'm just here to, to listen, but thank you. Okay. The next one is Ron Weber. Uh, we're good. We have nothing to say this evening. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next one is Elise Solomon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, um, I've already written a letter and I spoke at the last public hearing, but um, I'd just like to say after reviewing the last public hearing, the photos that were provided by Homeland Towers um, of the simulations made me cry. <laughs> there were no photos from my property and the cell tower was looming over my home. It doesn't belong in a residential neighborhood. Is there nowhere else it could go? And is there proof that there's nowhere else it can go? Pulling in my driveway when that balloon test was going on, it's the first thing that I saw. The visual impact was horrific from all places on my property. It would lessen my property value and my overall quality of life. Please say no to this application. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that was Lisa, so the next person is Ron and Gina Moseman. Moseman. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Good evening, and I thank you for the opportunity to express our concerns regarding the 15-story industrial cell phone tower proposition at our residential neighborhood. We've lived in our home, built it here, as a matter of fact, 23 years ago. Visitors to both our home and New Paltz community marvel at the natural beauty and majestic views that permeate our home and our neighborhood community. We are both disappointed and frankly a little heart sick to think of what might become of ours and our neighbors' pieces of paradise. It, it seems counterintuitive to what we all know and have come to know what is the fundamental mission and the very essence of our town to preserve the open spaces and protect the bucolic and pastoral views that we all enjoy. We could never imagine such an eyesore in this or any other residential community, and mind you, much taller than any of the mature and surrounding trees. We're also gravely concerned about what kind of precedent that this could may set in motion for the erection of future structures like fast food places, gas station hotels along the west end of Main Street. We actually have a view of Mohonk and the Shawangunks from our home. To look out our west facing window and see this monstrosity piercing the sky and littering the treasured views 
we all enjoy would be a front to all of us here on Jennifer Court, our neighborhood and beyond. Taking this proposal under serious consideration, we feel is a blatant disregard for all of us that cherish and call this neighborhood and our New Paltz community our home. And we thank you and we implore you to do the right thing, to do the neighborly thing. And for that, we will be forever grateful. And my husband likes to say one thing. I'd just like to point out to someone that spoke earlier that cell data is rarely used for gaming. Uh, the students on campus are going to be using internet, wireless internet, which is totally separate from cellular data. Okay, that does it for us, and we thank you for the time. Thank you. Currently, calling the game across your phone right now. And the next one is Caitlin Kennedy. Uh, yes, um, I just want to introduce myself again. I'm um, with Campanelli and Associates, and we're the attorneys for several of the neighboring um, homeowners. So I'll be brief, but I just wanted to point out a few things. Um, while we understand that the Rosenberg standard is what applies for use variance, we just want to remind the board that they can still consider um, aesthetic concerns um, as, a valid, as a valid basis for denying um, a zoning decision, and that um, you know, that comes from a case which is in the Second Circuit, uh, which is Cellular Telephone Company versus Town of Oyster Bay, and it also comes from New Singular Wireless, PCS, LLC versus the Town of Fenton. Um, so, that aesthetic concerns are uh, maybe something more for the planning board to consider, but as you heard, the residents are, um, the tower will stick out like a sore thumb. It will definitely be soaring higher than many of the trees in the area, as the residents have pointed out. Um, and additionally, the property value concerns um, are a big issue for many of the homeowners. It's demonstrated that having these kinds of towers close to and in residential neighborhoods, that property values of those surrounding homes will suffer. And I also just wanted to point out that the standard, um, you know, they, the applicants need to show that there's a need for the facility, and here they haven't done that. So to ask the board to make a decision based on evidence that was not provided to them isn't really logical. You know, um, I think someone mentioned that drops calls are kind of irrelevant, and while I understand that you're not just using your phone anymore for telephone calls, it's data and streaming and all that other things, the point of providing dropped call data and drive test analysis is to locate the exact location where there is a gap in service. And that goes into the smart planning, which smart planning, you don't want to have these towers all over your neighborhood and all over your town. So the drive test data and the drop call data helps to pinpoint exactly where these coverage gaps are so that you can find the best location to put these facilities. And that's why it's important that the applicant provide those to the board. And other than that, um, I guess those are really the only points that I, the main points that I wanted to make. Um, and there also isn't some concern with um, the fire hazards that the um, telephone, that the towers can pre present. Um, these do happen. They go on fire actually very often. I believe in our memorandum we provided pictures and links to websites that show these on fire. And I know that your town has um, a dry season where there's a burn ban. So that's also something that should be taken very seriously. Um, you don't, you know, wildfires and whatnot, the fact that the town has this burn ban is obviously a concern. So that's something that I think the board should also consider. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the next person is Terry Merrill. Terry Merrill? Yes, hi there, this is Terry. You can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, great. Um, yes, I spoke at the last um, public hearing also. Um, this time I wanted to point out that, um, that I've spoken to people in other towns where Homeland Towers came in proposing a cell tower with Verizon. Um, and uh, so even though this is my first rodeo, 
Um, I have had the benefit of some others' experiences. Um, so after the public hearing uh, here in June, um, several neighbors started to complain that their Verizon cell service, which they all had loved and said it was fantastic, um, they said that they were having problems with it, that it became degraded. Um, so I started poking around. It turns out that, um, that it was several people around the proposed site. They were Verizon customers said, you know, they always had four bars, always had four bars, and now they're only getting one or two, and they're getting weird, unusual quality problems, voices trailing off, coming back in. Um, some folks saying they couldn't even complete calls from their homes when they had never, ever had such a thing happen. Um, and uh, as a lot of people had already mentioned at the last public hearing, Verizon was very well known in the area to have great service, great coverage in New Paltz. So I reached out to my contacts in other towns and said, hey, this is happening in our town. What do you, what do you know about this? And everybody said, oh, yeah, that happened to us when they applied for permits in our towns. Same thing, unusual disruptions, quality issues. Now, my advice said to them is, well, you know, to my neighbors, looks like it's time to switch carriers, doesn't it? But um, the point is, is that, um, you know, it was, the, it was just the Verizon customers it wasn't any of the other folks. I had plenty of other people respond say, I don't have Verizon. I'm not having any problem. Um, but I will be getting in touch with, um, with the other uh, Verizon customers in New Pulse and see if it isn't just in our group that we're in contact with. But I, I'm mentioning it just because I wanted the board to hear that um, if there are complaints that have cropped up in the last few weeks, that we have a pretty strong feeling that it probably isn't because the, um, you know, the capacity issues or whatever just surged through the roof in the last couple of weeks, okay? All through COVID, we were not having this problem. Um, so there's, there's that. Something else that I was tipped off from, um, from the other towns was about the visual assessment. Um, in particular, I was told to keep an eye on that, especially the, um, the sites that were listed to be photographed, that um, apparently there was kind of a reputation going around that, um, that some of those pictures that were taken might be taken from unusual spots. Like one guy said, yeah, it looked like they took it from underneath a shrub or something. So... Um, so they said, just keep an eye on that. So, um, so that's what we did. And we had multiple people taking pictures of um, various sites. Um, so one of them that I would like to point out, now I'm not on video, so I can't show it to you, but I will put it in um, writing and I will email it to the boards. Um, but of the main site, of the, um, the proposed site itself, the picture that was presented at the um, at the public hearing, the first public hearing for ZBA, um, that picture does not look like anything like any of the other pictures that were taken by other people of that site on the day of the balloon test. Um, so I uh, compared my picture with other people's pictures um, of that site from the same day. And our pictures are just about identical, even though we were not at the same site at the same time. Um, so I will send you those. They, um, the pictures that I took and the picture that the other neighbor took of the site shows the balloon unobstructed by any trees in full glory, standing up way above the tree line um, and in very very clear, unobstructed view from the street. All right, so I will send you those, and I will also send you um, a snapshot, a screenshot, I should say, of the um, video 
that was shown by Matt Allen of his picture that he called VP1. And you can you can make your own assessment of that. Okay, Catherine, right. thank you. Okay, this was Terry. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Thank you, Terry. Okay, thank you. Terry. So there are several people that did not identify themselves. So I'm going to if they don't identify, they need to identify themselves. Yes, but some of them signed on a little after we started, so I just immediately okay. put them on mute. So I now oh, have sure. you unmuted. If I did not call your name, if you could introduce yourself, if you'd like to say something. Hello? Cheryl Rossi. Carol Rossi. Hello. Cheryl. Cheryl. Hi. Sorry. Okay. Do you have something that you'd like to add? Um. Yeah. I definitely second. Um. The, the people that have said that they see it, um, I saw the balloon from literally every window in the front of my house, my porch, and um, that was not represented in the photos taken. So, you know, that's not ideal. And the other thing is definitely uh, the, the, I'm not sure if this is correct, but I would imagine that if our property values go down, which we, there are several letters from real estate agents that are very, very sure that that would be the case, isn't that bad for the town? <laughs> Doesn't the town then lose money on our lower taxes because our property values have gone down? So I'm, I'm not sure what the logic is in, in putting this cell tower here when there's not a clear loss of cell reception in the area. Like, I'm just kind of at a loss. Like, why this monstrosity of a thing that is seen by so many people would be put up when it's not needed and would be a detriment to the town. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, anybody else that has not spoken that would like to speak, please identify yourself and give us your comments. Do you? Hello? Hello? Yes, I can hear you um, very quietly. Let you know. Could you speak Hello? a little bit louder? Oh, do you? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, um, I probably can tell a story that uh, from a recent house buyer perspective. Uh, I bought my house in the year 2016 or 2017. Uh, in that year, we were shopping around in those uh, neighborhood towns, and uh, we were we 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 found a very beautiful house, and we made the offer. And then when we drove around that house. We found there is a very high tower that's very close to that house. We didn't find it earlier, but then when we drove around, we find there is a high tower. Then we we tell we told our uh, real estate agent to turn down that offer. Even the buyer offered a lower price. We we turned down the offer. So I think if uh, if uh, this high tower is built in this residential area, that not only will decrease the uh, house price. Sometimes a lot, lot of times it, it will make the buyer do not want to buy the house. Uh, and honestly, if this, if this high tower is, is erected in this residential area, we have to, we may have to consider to move again, move to the neighborhood town. So please do not allow a high tower uh, to be built in this residential area. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the others, again, if you have comments, you are unmuted, please identify yourself and Provide your comments. Well, Mr. Chairman, there's three people online, but it does not appear that they. Yes, um, sorry, sorry. Harriet Clark. Harriet Clark, thank you. Okay. Trying to get through. Sorry, Harriet Clark Weber. And I just want to reiterate what my neighbors have already said. Um, and we believe uh, that the the zoning laws are here to protect the town and the residents' interests, and most importantly, to protect the value and the integrity of our properties in our neighborhood. And um, they're asking for a variance because they are not abiding by the, you know, it's something that's gonna be a variance to that. Um, after careful consideration, my husband and I too moved in three years ago to this beautiful property um, because of the natural beauty and because we believe the town of New Paltz took seriously the custodianship of this land. And really that was part of the identity of the town. 
And we were horrified when we could see the balloon from every part of our property. That um, it's just heartbreaking. We came here to retire. My husband has passed away from the COVID, and so he will not get to retire here, but I hope to. And I know that he was heartbroken at just the thought of a tower for something that is going to provide a service that we have not even proven is necessary. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much for giving us the time, and please, please do not allow this to go forward. Thank you. Um, so there's one person left that has not identified themselves. The other person dropped off. Um, okay. If you would like to speak, please identify yourself and we will hear your comments. Um, doesn't appear that they would like to speak. Okay, so at this point in time, since there are, is no one else to speak and everyone had the opportunity to speak that would like to speak, I would like to entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Was that a second? I'll second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Public hearing is now closed. We still will entertain letters emailed to the uh, planning board secretary. If you have anything else that you would like to add to it as a comment. At this point in time, Pat, when will the next meeting be? Well, I guess Kelly, you'll tell us when in fact, you will be available for the next meeting. Yes. So right now, the governor has extended the ability to have virtual meetings, the ability to have virtual meetings through August sixth, and also the requirement that public can be virtual through August 6th. So as he did this time, he waited until probably about 11 o'clock to extend it on that day. Um, so we won't know until that day if he's going to continue it. Um, when is your normal meeting night? August, August 11th is the next ZBA meeting. Okay. Yes, so that meeting night, it is after the August 6th date um but i i'm unavailable that night um and actually rick is unavailable that night so he would be able to take my place um but i would be available on the 12th which is the following night if you that would be a wednesday correct that would yes. be a wednesday yes i think we should typically plan for that we can always cancel it Okay. Is Rick available? Joe, are you available? Um, yes, Leonard. Okay. Board members, are you available? Yes. No. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> I am. <laughs> Catherine, are you available? I'm available. Okay. Is it? We got Stephen. We got Caroline. Me. Yes. Okay. Stacy, you available? I am available, but you know if it's going to be available. Okay. Rick, are you available that night? Yes, I am. Okay. Can't hear you. I'm here, Rick. Oh, he said yes. Rick said yes, he's available. Okay. Okay. We'll plan on that night then. Um, did you want to give a deadline? Um, I'm sure Joe was about to say this. So I'm, I apologize for stepping on your toes here, Joe. Just wondering if we're going to give a deadline for public co uh, written comments to be submitted. Public written comments will say, um, what's the Friday before the Wednesday? What date is that? Be? August 7th. August 7th. Okay. Let's say August 7th. Pat, are you available to receive... Uh, no, let's not do a Friday. Let's do a Thursday. Let's make it the sixth. Okay. That way it'll August. get past. We you'll be you'll be you'll be there August sixth. Yeah, probably. Yes. <laughs> okay. So any other submissions that come in, you can move forward. Okay. All right. Leonard. 
any new business to discuss. Can I can I jump in on my muted or what, Kelly? No, you're fine, though. I just just a, a couple of things before we go on, and since the board is still there, and I guess I'm gonna maybe direct this to both Rick Golden and the applicant regarding the closing of the public hearing at this point. Um, are there any issues with that that either of the attorneys see? Because I know we're still waiting for the report from Mike New, so that will come in at some time in the future. Uh, from, from the applicant standpoint, we just respectfully request the opportunity to see the public comments and have the ability to respond. I know there were a couple uh, letters that were mentioned this evening. I'm not sure if I have copies of those. Uh, so we just respectfully request to be able to receive, review, and respond to uh, to those correspondences, including Mr. Musso's report. And to be due then uh, by the well, the sixth of August. Yes. Yes. All right. Because if everybody has until the sixth to submit them, if something comes in on the sixth, the applicant wouldn't maybe wouldn't have an opportunity to respond to it by then joe yes uh, if i could suggest something it, it's at least in my experience it's typical to allow the applicant to have an opportunity to respond in written comments that are submitted um, after the close of the public hearing uh, so maybe if you um, allow the applicant until the following monday um, to submit in writing um their responses to whatever they want to respond to that was submitted after the public um or at tonight's uh, hearing if it was written um the i i think the closing the public hearing is fine obviously it starts the clock for purposes of a 62 day for decision making um you're going to be discussing at the next meeting. I think that's when you decide whether or not you'll be able to make the 62 day deadline for deciding it or because of the way the meetings fall, you may miss it by a couple of days and ask for an extension from Mr. Gaudioso, which I'm sure that he will grant of a few days in order for you to have a decision no later than um, your meeting in September. Uh, would be the meeting in a meeting in September, correct? Thank you, Rich. So Joe, I, I have a question. It's procedural. We're talking about 62 days. Uh, the applicant is challenging my determination, so an application needs to be made for that um, in regards to use variance. Stacy, Stacy. Stacy, the, um, the applicant has withdrawn their appeal of your determination. Oh, okay. It was not so aware. That, um, at this point in time, uh, the status of this, as I understand it, Joe can correct me if he has a different view of it, is that we are really in a status quo ante. That is that everything the way it was before uh, your determination will continue as before the planning board and the ZBA. That's the ZBA will continue to hear the public utility use variance and the planning board will continue to hear site plan, special permit, and wetlands permit. And okay. Mr. Buddy also, can you confirm that? Yes, that's correct. Just just for the record, um, Stacy, it was a letter uh, received today, just today, July 22nd, 2020, that withdrew the, the appeal from your determination. Rick is correct. So that has been withdrawn. Um, so then for the, for the record, uh, going back to my original question, if the public then submits comment by Thursday the 6th and Leonard would the applicant then have until the end of Monday before that next meeting to reply if they choose. That would be the 10th. Yes. Mr. Gaudioso, that, is that okay with you? I, I believe that should be fine. My, my only hesitation is I, I don't know the, the breadth of the comments um, since the public is getting, you know, approximately two weeks and we're getting, you know, two days. Uh, 
you know, I, I will just say that I, I'd like to see what the comments are, uh, um, you know, given that disparity. Understood. There are some things that I think we can, Pat, that we can get out to the applicant, those submissions that Leonard spoke yeah. about at the meeting. Yeah, those, those, um, the ones that that one spoke about at the beginning of the meeting, they were actually submitted after the last meeting, so they were also they were sent. And the oh, ones okay. tonight that came in dur just as we were logging on and getting on to the meeting, um, I read the one, and right. the other comments that I got were people who were just having problems getting into the meeting, the telecon. So there was only the one I read tonight. And anything that I get, I do forward as soon as I get it. Okay. Great, thank you. Yep. Thank you, Leonard. Okay, any more comments or any more discussion from anyone else for this evening? Entertain a motion to close the meeting. Uh, I'm, that's a move. Second, someone? I second. All those signify by aye. Aye. Aye, it is. Good night to all. Thank you all for coming to the meeting. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Pally. <laughs> no problem. Thanks, Pally.